All right, everybody, we are back to finish up section three of our public policy course. And uh, this is the final section just on policy formulation. Okay, so how are policies, uh, how do those turn, go from being agenda items into actual laws that legislators can then vote on or presidents can sign or, or uh, you know, whatever the uh, level of government we're talking about. So, we have an agenda item of, you know, crime. We need to increase the number of police officers. Well, now we need to work on the details, right? How many police officers? How much money are we going to spend here? How much are we going to do this? And the entire process of, of getting things from a general idea into specifics really relies on these four questions, okay? Number one, is it technically sound? Can we do this? Not only... Do we have the, um, the legal authority to do this? Um, but is this something that even makes sense, right? Um, so if we want to pass a law saying, you know, hurricanes uh, can no longer fly in United States airspace, that's not really technically sound, right? Um, or if we want to say, you know, people can't can no longer wear red shirts. You know, it is a crime to wear red shirts now. Well, they, you, you know, the U.S. government doesn't have the legal authority to do that, right? Second thing is, is it worth the money and resources? So is spending $100 billion to lower crime by a projected 2% really going to be worth it, right? Um... We have a, you know, we've got a lot of money as a country. Your state might have a lot of money, um, but it's nowhere near endless. And they only have certain amounts of both money and people and time and, you know, all the other resources that we may need to expend to change or implement some policy. Three, is it politically acceptable? Is there any chance it's going to make it through the process, Right. If we pass a very uh, conservative law and there's a Democratic president, or if we pass a very liberal law but there's a Republican president, is it worth even starting to, to create this policy knowing that it's never going to make it past the finish line and into law? And then, of course, is it acceptable to the public? Will the people like this policy change? Will they... Uh, embrace it? Will it help those of us who voted for it when we go up for election next time, right? So we have to kind of answer yes to all of these before we're going to put forth the effort to actually create this policy and try to pass it through the, the legal process. Now, who is it or what groups or what entities can create these policies? Can, you know, going from the general idea to the actual uh, uh, nuts and bolts part of making a policy? Well, there's a lot of them. First off, there's just existing policies, right? I mean, tons of people and organizations and previous governmental members have done this work for a lot of different possible policies before. Can we just copy those ideas? Maybe just 100%, maybe just most of it and modify a little, right? But there's existing policy out there all over the place that we can kind of uh, uh, take from in order to create our new existing policy, right? The president or the president's advisors can kind of get together and work on details and how exactly we're going to implement this and how are we going to word it and how are we going to, you know, take this from that general idea of we want more police officers to, okay, here's how much money we're going to spend. Here's how we're going to do this. Is it going to be just local police or, or is it going to be state police too? Like what, uh, making all those kind of detailed decisions uh, especially when it comes to things like, uh, you know, the president has a lot of power over things like foreign policy, um, inter uh, uh, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, how the federal government itself works with executive orders, things like that. Um, different agencies, you know, everything from the Environmental Protection Agency to the FBI to the Treasury Department to the FCC. They have a lot of expertise in their particular sub area of government function and policy. And thus, they're going to have a lot of input and a lot of um, ability to hash out these details, to figure out the specifics, to go from that general idea to um, specifics. Um, a relatively common occurrence in government is for there to be a commission or a committee designed to research a certain topic area or solve a certain problem or create a certain policy, right? Um, there was uh, famously the Rogers Commission after the, uh, the Challenger space shuttle accident. Um, but there was also the uh, law enforcement, oh gosh, I can't even remember the full name of it. It had some big long name, but it was a law enforcement presidential commission back in the 60s uh, that met together with experts, both from policing and, and Congress and uh, different law enforcement organizations and, and levels of government. Uh, and they got together and created a whole giant report uh, about how uh, I th President Johnson at the time could uh, kind of help support law enforcement, how, how law enforcement nationally could kind of move forward. Um, legislators can come up with ideas and, and sit down and do the nuts and bolts part of uh, policy formation. But more commonly, it's not the legislators themselves that do it, it's their staff. It's somebody that works for them, right? Congress and congressional members hire lots of people that know exactly how to write laws and um, you know, create policy from a nuts and bolts perspective. Um, interest groups, obviously, will, will have lots of proposed policy language and policy details. Um, Again, this is even more common at the state level than the federal level, just because state level legislators don't have the staff or the time uh, to do this kind of thing themselves for every law they want to, they might want to make. So interest groups are able to kind of, you know, write a law or propose language or propose specifics and then just bring it straight to that state legislator who then introduces it as a law. Um, either with no modification or with minor modifications. <clears throat> and then, of course, there's other states and other countries, right? So if I am a, a government official for the state of Tennessee and I need to enact a new policy on uh, crime or health care or taxes or whatever, I can look around at other states and say, hey, what's working? What's not working? Who has the lowest crime rate in the country? Let's look at those state policies on, on criminal justice and just kind of copy from them, right? Or um, <clears throat> my country is trying to deal with health care. Well, what country around the world has the best health care program um, with the healthiest people and the, the longest lives? Let's do what they do. So let's take their system and, and slightly modify it or, or uh, you know, make it work for uh, here in the United States. And then let's just kind of copy from the people that are doing it the best, right? Um, I've actually done some work with uh, uh, the Philippines. And in the Philippines, um, they do this relatively commonly. Uh, I was even told that in their Supreme Court of the Philippines will often cite... United States Supreme Court precedent when uh, faced with certain types of cases. So other states or other nations or other cities or other levels of government, um, we can always look to them for these kind of specifics in policy. And we don't have to come up with new ideas ourselves. We don't have to reinvent the wheel as the kind of state goes. All right, so the actual process of policy formulations, right? We decide on a policy. We can even decide on details. But then the really, really difficult part of it is actually writing that policy. Creating a law. Putting pen to paper. 
even if you've worked out details, even if you've worked out, you know, uh, really specific stuff, you still have to write that policy in such a way um, that it's clear what it's doing and it doesn't leave open loopholes. Because as soon as you pass a new policy, there's going to be some organization or some number of people who are immediately going to say, well, I don't want to abide by that. So I'm going to look for ways to kind of get out of it, to make it so this doesn't apply to me. Um, and these loopholes are kind of an important thing for people who actually write legislate, le legislation to be very, very, very careful about, right? There is a reason that lawyers and politicians and congressional staffers and such make so much money because you have to be very, very precise in your language. You have to be really precise. Um, there have been court cases involving millions of dollars that revolve around whether there was a comma or not. The, the, the precise meaning of the word and in a certain instance. Um, so when these policies and laws are written, you have to be so careful about how, exactly how they're written down to the last word, down to the last piece of punctuation. Um, and, and words have different meanings and especially with, with certain vague words, right? So as, a, as an example, um, the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, grants us the right to a speedy and public trial. What exactly does speedy mean, right? And what speedy meant in 1788 or 89 might not be the same as what speedy means in the 21st century. So do we accept what they meant as speedy when they wrote it? Or do we change that to mean speedy in the 21st century? Um, so kind of the definition of words can change and do change over time and, and how people see things. Um, so that has to be very, very clearly expressed and delineated. Now, when judges are gauging the constitutionality or applicability of a law, and it's kind of a little bit unclear, they run into one of those situations where, you know, the definition of a word might not be quite right, it's a little vague, we're not quite sure exactly what this law is trying to say. Um, a lot of judges will look at what's called the legislative history, right? So as that bill or that law was passing through Congress, different members of Congress would kind of put their thoughts on that law into the official congressional record, right? So it's kind of commentary about the law that is official. It's in the, the record of congressional proceedings. Um, you know, our intention with this crime law is to make sure that this happens and this happens and this happens. And so judges, uh, a lot of judges look at that legislative history when trying to decide exactly what certain words mean or exactly what speedy means in the in the uh, bill of rights or um whether this should be and or or you know that kind of thing um and they use that history to guide them into enforcing the law and making a decision that reflects what congress's intention was when they passed that law there are other judges that have kind of said, uh, we shouldn't do that. Instead of judging what was intended by this law, we need to judge what is actually written on the page. Or, you know, these days, computer screen. Um, we need to only judge laws based on the actual text of the law and the meanings that those words mean uh, kind of globally rather than what they meant to the people that wrote them. Uh, so that's kind of one of the controversies in judicial decision-making. It's a relatively minor one, but it's, you know, it is an important one. All right, that is the end of section three. Thank you, thank you guys so much for watching. It's been a long day.